Well, hello again, friends, and welcome to our online worship service for the week of March 14th. As always, I'm Don Ebert, lead pastor here of the Wadsworth United Methodist Church, and I am so thankful that you are able to join us for worship this week. This is the fourth Sunday of our season of Lent, and we're continuing in our worship series, our sermon series, Lord, Teach Us to Pray. And this morning, we're going to focus on that part of the Lord's Prayer where Jesus said, Your will be done. And so to get us started this morning, I'd like you to join me in the reading of these verses. Psalm 106, verses 1 through 5. I'll read the leader's part and invite you to join me in the people's part. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord who is good, whose steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty doings of the Lord? or show forth all God's praises. Blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteous at all times. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you deliver them, that I may see the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your heritage. Will you join me in prayer? Father God, we thank you as we gather this morning to worship you. Bless us. We enthrone you on our praises. Meet us here through the power of your Holy Spirit. For it's in Jesus' name we gather, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, our opening song is from our praise band. They pre-recorded this song a while back, but it's entitled, Take My Life. And as you sing or listen along, Particularly, pay attention to the words. It's almost as much a prayer as it is a song. So join in the singing of the song, Take My Life. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Holiness. Holiness is what you want from me. And faithfulness, faithfulness is what I long for. Faithfulness is what I need. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what you want from me. Take my heart for me, take my mind, transform it, take my will, conform it to yours, to yours, O oh Lord, to yours, to yours, O oh Lord. Righteousness, righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness is what I need. And righteousness, righteousness is what you want from me. And brokenness, brokenness. Is what I long for. Brokenness is what I need. And brokenness, brokenness is what you want from me. Oh, Lord. 
There are a number of announcements in your bulletin, and again, uh, the bulletin is available to view or download from our website, so I encourage you to do that. But I'd like to highlight just a, a couple of the announcements. Uh, special thanks to Patty King for the beautiful altar flowers and loving memory of her father and mother, uh, Dallas and Francis G Gregory. Just remember, if you want to join us for in-person worship on Sunday mornings, every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., you need to make reservations. Uh, you can do that by going to our, our website uh, and clicking on that button. Uh, and also, just as a reminder, we have increased our in-person uh, worship uh, to 75 now, so uh, please be aware of that. Easter flower orders, uh, they are due uh, March uh, 21st, next Sunday. Also, our Wadsworth Christian Preschool still taking applications for next school year. So if you know anyone who's looking for a great preschool, uh, please send them our way. Uh, there's information in your bulletin about church camps, our conference camps this summer. Uh, there's a display also in the lobby of our church too, but see that announcement if you're interested in church camps. Also, this is a United Methodist Committee on Relief Sunday, UMCOR. And, and so if you'd like to make a special offering uh, to UMCOR, just please be sure to designate that on your envelope or on your check. And also United Methodist Women, uh, there's some news uh, about uh, United Methodist Women. It's pledge time. So uh, United Methodist Women, ladies, uh, be sure to check out the announcement uh, in your bulletin about that. Last week, we premiered our first episode of our web series, Coffee Talk. And here's Tim Beck uh, to give us a preview uh, of this week's Coffee Talk. Take a look. Coffee Talk is a place that we intend to facilitate some safe conversations about life, about faith. Hopefully these conversations will challenge you and, and encourage you as well. Now we all know that life has been much of a struggle lately. Life has been crazy, but if you really stop and think about it, life is always crazy. I mean, we're sort of living in a lot of uncertainty right now, but let's keep it real. Life is always filled with a lot of unknowns. From birth, through adolescence, through your teenage years, young adulthood, marriage, parenting, empty nesters, retirement, life is a mystery. But let's embrace that chaos and the unknown together. I've become a lot of more aware lately that, you know, everybody's going through something and no matter what you or I might be dealing with, we got to recognize that we're not alone in this. And what better way to do that than through meaningful conversations? So grab your cup of coffee and settle in because we're here to create some content that we hope will brighten your day as we dig deep into important conversations that are affecting you today. And today's topic is joy and how that joy and happiness can lead to empathy. And again, this week's topic for Coffee Talk is happiness and empathy. So we had a really good turnout uh, for our uh, premiere uh, last week. So join us uh, this week for Coffee Talk. At this time, here's Mr. Doug in Mops with a preview of this week's episode of Faith Factory. Well, hello. Welcome to Faith Factory, where we make disciples of Jesus Christ. I'm Mr. Doug. And I am Mops. And we have lots of fun planned today for this episode of Faith Factory. We're going to be talking about Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're going to learn what that word means, Gethsemane. And also, if you look in the back there, you see something going on. And we're going to talk about what else was happening while Jesus was praying. He's talking to God and the disciples are doing something else in the background so we'll find out what was going on in our story in the great big bible and we also have our memory verse that we're learning during the month of march from matthew 26 verse 56a and this is what jesus said about all the things that were happening during holy week and as we're talking about prayer today we're going to play a game and learn the four parts of prayer that jesus taught p r a why each of these letters stands for a part of prayer and we're going to find out what they mean and how we can pray as jesus taught p r a 
why. So you see, we're going to have lots of fun today at Faith Factory. Hope you can join us today at 11 o'clock. If not, sometime early this week, all you have to do is just go to our church website, wadsworthumc.com, click on the Faith Factory button and watch the episode. You can also click on the Faith Factory activity page button and you'll get the activity pages and craft that go along with today's episode. So we're excited. We hope you'll join us. Have a great worship service and we'll see you a little bit later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good morning, friends. As we continue through the Lenten season, I want to call your attention to a memory verse from the Psalms. And this is complimentary to Pastor Don's sermon last week where he encouraged us to turn from asking God for things when we pray to praising God and thanking God. And so the words of Psalm chapter 8, verse 1 say this. This is something we can memorize. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Say that with me. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Memorize that this week, Psalm 8, 1. I want us to keep the following people in our prayers this week. And I'm going to ask you to bow your heads now and silently pray for these names as I, as I slowly read them. Will you pray for them wherever you are this morning? David Byers, Sandy, Nato, Charlotte, Daniels, Jeanette White, Ken Filbert, Jack, Gore, Bob Hasenjaeger, Jeff Campbell, Adam Hoff, Michael Satink, Don Ebert, Tim Beck, Dale and Lois Turner, Beth and Robert Hoff, Frank and Jennifer Satink. Loving God, thank you for those who pray for us. We're here today because over the history of our lives, since we've been followers of you, people have prayed for us. And now during this Lenten season, we pray for others. Where there's a need for healing, Jesus, you're the great physician, touch them with your healing presence. Where there's a need for comfort, Come to them quickly through your Holy Spirit as you promised long ago to your disciples that Comforter will come and you promised the Holy Spirit would come after you, would fill our hearts, would remind us of your words, and would give us strength. And then, loving Father, teach us to love as you love. We know that your word says that those who love God demonstrate that love by loving their neighbor. So help us to be loving to our neighbors. And Lord, we want to pray for the world today. We want to lift up our leaders of our country and the countries of the world, of our state and the states of the United States, of our local leaders, everyone where they're trying to fight this horrible pandemic. And we pray this morning for the end of the pandemic. We pray that we might know that it is near, that the end is coming. We pray that soon we will be back together uh, in worship at church and in Sunday school and with children and youth programs. We pray that our rejoicing will once again be heard in the sanctuary and in the world. Lord, we miss our singing, we miss our hugging, and we miss our meeting together. So we ask that soon, soon the pandemic will end and we will be together. We thank you, Lord for this moment of prayer, for this season of Lent in which we pause, quietly wait and listen, and invite you to change our lives. So continue to help us to grow, follow Jesus more closely. As we pray all these things in his name, the one who taught us to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Have a great week. God bless you.
Just appreciate so much our virtual choir. Appreciate Alex and Brenda and everyone uh, who is uh, participating in our virtual choir. Well, we are in week four of our series, Lord, Teach Us to Pray, and we're looking specifically at what Jesus taught us about prayer. And today we're going to look at how God answers prayer. And to many folk, quite honestly, that's the whole point of prayer, isn't it? You know, how do we get God uh, to give us things? And so we're going to look again at that passage in Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 9. Jesus said this, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now we are all familiar with filling out applications to get things. We're used to all sorts of application procedures, whether it's online or whether it's on paper. You know, some of them are very involved. Some of them are very lengthy. And we say, okay, well, prayer, prayer is just another application. How do you fill out the application to get God to give me what I want? I mean, isn't that the point of prayer? Well, my hope is that up to this point in, in this series, that you, you're beginning to realize that, that prayer is just not trying to get God to give you what you want or what, what you need. Because if, if you think that's the main point of prayer, you're probably going to get very little out of it. In fact, there's sort of an irony when it comes to prayer. Prayer is very effective for those who don't enter into it thinking that it's just a means of trying to get God to give you things. In James chapter 5, we read the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And I would add, so is the person who prays not necessarily trying to just get things from, from God. Because we said, friends, that, that prayer is meant to be this time where we center our hearts and our thoughts and our minds back on God. You know, it's kind of like an old washing machine that Susan and I had in our very first home that, that we built. We built our home. We were, we were in debt with a, a construction loan. We were poor. We couldn't afford a new washing machine, machine so we, we bought an old used Sears Kenmore washing machine. And every once in a while, when that old washing machine would go into the spin cycle, it would sound like somebody was beaten on the side of that machine with a hammer. I mean, it was just loud. In fact, there was a cemetery about a quarter of a mile down the road from our house. And one time the thing was so loud that it woke the dead and the dead came down and they, no, no, but it was loud. In fact, you used to have to go down to the, the basement, down in the, the basement steps, and the thing would be shaking and it would be walking across the basement floor. You'd have to lift the lid, you'd have to stop it, you'd have to rearrange all the wet clothes, you've all done it before, and then restart it. If it wasn't balanced, if it wasn't centered, it wouldn't work properly. Well, friends, you and I are like that whole washing machine. If we're not centered properly, then we're not going to work properly. And prayer is about centering our hearts and our lives and our minds around God. And that's the point of prayer. And to say that the point of prayer is to center our lives and our hearts on God, it doesn't mean to just say it. It means to actually make God the center when we pray. That's the hard work of prayer. And so Jesus says there's movement in, in prayer. Jesus teaches us that, that first you have to center your hearts and your minds on the godliness, the, the fatherliness of God, and the heavenliness of God. Our Father who art in heaven. We talked about that last week. And we also talked about how Jesus says, then you move on to praise and adoration. Hallowed be thy name. Next, Jesus says, you have to submit to the royal kingship of Christ, your kingdom come. And Jesus says, then and only then can you start making your 
requests, asking God for your daily bread, your, your needs, your provision. Then you can ask for protection. Then you can ask for forgiveness. But Jesus says everything up to that point, everything, the first part of the prayer, the centering and the adoration of prayer, Jesus says, they all come to a climax in that phrase, your will be done. And Jesus says you, you can't do an end run around it. You can't start asking about specific needs until you're able to say, God, I submit right now to your lordship. I commit everything to your will. Then Jesus says, you can begin making your petition for your provision. Give us this day our daily bread. Then you can go to confession. Forgive us our trespasses. Then you can go on and ask for protection. Deliver us from evil, from things that we're fearful of. But only, Jesus says, do you go there after you can say, your will be done. Jesus says there's an order, and it has to be honored. And if you don't, you rip the very fabric of prayer apart. First, there's accepting, there's submitting, and then there is asking. That's the order. And so let's apply it. What does it mean, your will be done? Well, I think the first thing we need to understand about that prayer is that it, it goes right at the teeth of our culture. There's an author by the name of Alan Ehrenholt, and he writes this, Most of us in America believe a few simple propositions that seem so clear and self-evident, they scarcely need to be said, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident. Choice is a good thing in life, and the more of it we have, the happier we are. Authority is inherently suspect. Nobody should have the right to tell others what to think or how to behave. And I think that's true. Most Americans were taught to think that the more freedom you have to decide right from wrong, and the less others tell you what you have to do, the happier you are. That's the essence of the American culture. And in the middle of that, Jesus says, when you come into God's presence in prayer, you have to pray, your will be done. Right out of the chute. And for some of it, it goes against everything we have been taught most or all of our lives. And so what does it mean to pray, your will be done? Well, I'd like to give you three case studies. And the first one is the Apostle Paul. And it is a great case study. Because if you look at every place in Paul's letters where he prays for his friends, there's two places in the book of Ephesians. There's one in the first chapter of Philippians, and there's one in the first chapter of Colossians. What you'll find is something just totally remarkable in the prayers of Paul for his friends. And I wish we had time to look into them, but we don't. So I encourage you to read those verses on your own this week. But surprisingly, what is absent from prayers of Paul for his friends are relief from troubles, prayers for healing, prayers for overcoming problems, or prayers for happiness. Instead, the Apostle Paul, with great detail, prays that his friends would have spiritual insight and that they would have this overwhelming sense of the grandeur and the glory of God and that they have a living, transforming, active faith. That's what Paul wants more than anything else for his friends. And he leaves out all the other things that surely they were dealing with and that was plaguing them. And he doesn't mention them. And you got to wonder why. Well, I think that's why it's so odd or it's strange to us because, friends, we are obsessed with this idea that the reason that we are unhappy is because of the things outside of us. 
We assume that the reason that we are so unhappy is because certain external outward conditions on the outside are making us unhappy. And we're almost obsessed with this thinking that if we can change our external condition, everything will be fine and we'll be happy. And Paul said that's not the case. He said the case is what you really need. It's not on the outside. It's on the inside. Paul says our real problem is a lack of knowledge, a lack of true understanding of who God is and enjoying God. It's a lack of love for God. It's a lack of our understanding. Our problem, Paul says, comes not from an external condition, from an, but from an internal one. And Paul realizes our problem is that we just don't comprehend enough about the glory and the greatness of God and the privileges that we have in Jesus Christ. The reason you're anxious, the reason you're miserable, Paul would say is because you don't understand enough about the goodness and the power of your God. You may know it in your head, but you don't know it in your heart. It doesn't thrill you. It doesn't move you. It doesn't affect you. And Paul knows that it's not the threatening situation around you that's making you miserable. It's your inability to see clearly who God is and what you have in Christ. I don't know about you, but every time I'm down, every time I'm depressed, it's usually because there's something I want more or something I value more than my inheritance and my status as a child of God in Jesus Christ. Now let me bring this down to earth, okay, as simply as I can. Our three-year-old grandson, Jones, he loves playing with trucks and toy, and toy trucks and toy cars. He's got race tracks and he's got these construction sets that he sets up and he plays with his trucks and his cars for hours. And every time we babysit him, every time we watch him, he always has a different truck that's his, it's his favorite truck. Now imagine if Jones was playing with his favorite truck and it breaks. The most important thing in his life in that moment. And he's crying and he's upset. And I come up to him and he's crying. I say, hey, Jones, don't worry about that broken truck. You just got a letter in the mail, Jones, and somebody left you. You just inherited $20 million. Now, is a three-year-old who just broke his favorite toy truck, is he going to care about an inheritance of $20 million? I don't think so. And what's the problem? It's because a child, a three-year-old, doesn't have the mental ability to grasp that $20 million is more valuable than his favorite toy truck. He'd be fine. He'd be great if he could just realize and understand his new condition. Right? And yet, friends... There are some of you who know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You know you've been adopted into the family of God. You know you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. You may even know that someday you are going to reign and rule with Him forever. And yet, it's your financial problems or your relationship problems or your whatever problems that are robbing you and destroying your happiness. And so you look around and you say, hey, what good does it mean or what good is it to be a Christian? And you're in the exact condition as a three-year-old. It's not the problem that's, that's causing your lack of happiness. It's the fact that you don't realize who you are and what you have in Jesus Christ. And so that's why Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 3. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen, God may strengthen you with power through his spirit in the inner being, in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love 
may have the power, together with all of the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know his love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the full measure or the measure of all the fullness of God. And Paul understands you don't run in and give God your gimme list until you've at least attempted to try to comprehend who God is and who you are in Christ. Let me give you another case study. It's the ultimate case study of somebody who prayed, not my will, but yours be done. Who is it? Yeah, it's Jesus. In fact, this is the only part of the prayer that Jesus taught that we actually have an example of Jesus praying that prayer. And remember the context, right? Remember when this happened, when Jesus prayed, your will be done. He was in this place called Gethsemane. And what was Jesus facing? What was before him? Well, literally, it was hell. It was the punishment for for our sins. Jesus was about to be crucified for our sins. And the Bible's clear about the punishment for, for sin. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul writes, They, the ungodly, will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. See, friends, you and I, we were built for God. And if we're going to have any kind of physical, emotional, or spiritual well-being, it only comes from God supporting our life. It's like we got to have the sun in order for there to be life on this earth. And even when the, the earth is turned away from the sun so we don't actually see the sun, we know that the sun is still there supporting us and giving us life through its power and its radiation. And we know that even when we can't see the sun, it's there. Even in the darkness, when we can't see the sun, we're still being upheld by the sun. The same is true even of people who are are fleeing away from God, who are turning away from God. It's even true of people who say they don't believe in God. They are still being upheld by God. And that's what the Bible says. And so to be cut off from God means to, to, to no longer have God's life support. It means to be cast into utter darkness It means to come to a place where you can no longer function as a human being, to be totaled as a human being. It's like a car. When a car is totaled, it doesn't cease to exist. It's still there, but it can't function as a car any longer. Well, the same is true for a human being when it's totaled. He or she still exists, but it, but it can't function. It can't love. It can't receive love. It can't experience peace and joy. You can't function when you're cut off from God. It's hell. And in Gethsemane, Jesus began to experience the rejection that he was going to experience as the substitute for us on the cross. And the Bible says he began to sweat drops of blood. The very anticipation, the foretaste of that pain and agony was so difficult that it caused the eternal Son of God to sweat blood. And if that was just the taste, I can't imagine what the actual experience was like. But in the face of of that agony and pain, Jesus looked up to his father. He was alone with his father. Everyone else was asleep. And he looked up to the father and said, Father, I would like out of this. I'm beginning to taste this cup. And in the the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, the cup, it was symbolic of the anger and the wrath and the judgment of God. And Jesus said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But immediately he says, nevertheless. 
And it's clear from his nevertheless that he had already submitted. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Father, I'd like you to get, I'd like you to get me out of this. But if that's not possible, I believe, I have faith that you will bring immeasurable blessing and goodness out of this. Not my will, but yours be done. And what did it cost Jesus? Well, we may never know. But I know that Jesus was facing blind, mind-blowing agony. None of us will ever come anywhere close to that. No human has ever paid such an incredible price, nor will ever pay such a price to pray, your will be done. Yet in Jesus' case, he paid the greatest price to pray that. And it was worth it. It was worth it. Because those hours of absolute mind-blowing pain resulted in a glorious salvation and a new redeemed world that will last forever. And somebody will say, well, so what? That's interesting, Pastor Don. It's a little bit moving, but you know what? I'm not Jesus. If you're telling me I got to look at my problems in the face and say, not my will, but your be done. Well, I'm, I'm not Jesus. Okay, Pastor Don, if Jesus could do that, fine. He was the son of God. I'm not Jesus. Well, you're right. And nobody's ever going to be asked to do exactly what Jesus did. No one could duplicate what Jesus said or what Jesus did. But you know what is possible, friends, on a much lower level? We can imitate him. We can imitate him. And that brings us to the last case study. A little over 100 years ago, a guy by the name of George Matheson, he was a Christian He was about to be married. And while he was engaged, he became permanently blind. And not only did he have to face a lifetime of darkness, but in the wake of that, his fiance broke off their engagement. And he thought he was relegated to a life not only of darkness, but a lifetime of loneliness. You know, either one of those you might be able to bear, but both of them together? And what did he do? Well, he wrote a hymn. It's in our hymnal. It's entitled, Oh, Love That Will Not Let Me Go. It's not my favorite hymn, but you know what's a fascinating hymn? And the more I read about the story of George Matheson, it's an example of a a human who prayed that prayer, Your will be done. And if you'll let me, I'd like to show you what I mean. George Matheson writes in his hymn, I give thee back the life I owe. And right there, friends, we see the difference between you and me and Jesus. Because Jesus is the only person who, when he prayed, your will be done, who, when he suffered, he didn't deserve it. He's the only one who could ever say, I don't owe anybody. You see, friends, when Jesus was in Gethsemane about to drink the cup of God's judgment, Jesus would have been perfectly justified if he would have said, why should I? Why should I leave my glory in heaven to come to earth? Why should I take on this agony for these people who don't appreciate what I'm doing, who don't deserve what I'm doing, and will never repay me for what I'm doing? I don't owe them anything. And Jesus had every right to say that. But instead, he said, Father, for your sake and for theirs, I'll take the cup. But when he prayed, your will be done, he owed no one. But you and I, 
No one else can say that. And George Matheson, sitting in darkness and blindness and loneliness, he said, Father, I owe you everything. Everything is better than the hell that Jesus suffered for me. Every moment of every single day is pure grace. I owe you everything. And so George Matheson could say, I give you back the life I owe. He starts the hymn off with the, the title phrase, Oh, love that will not let me go. That's amazing. Before he says, I owe you my life, he says, Lord, I see that everything that you do in my life, it's according to your loving purpose. Your love, O oh God, is the only love that does not reject me even when I'm blind. No matter what happens to me, I'm never alone. And I can build my life on the only love that will last forever. Oh, love that will not let me go. He doesn't knuckle under the weight and the pressure of God's will. He accepts it as God's loving purpose. And finally, in the last verse, he says this. I lay in dust life's glory dead, and from the ground there blossoms red life that shall endless be. Matheson, he realizes in praying, your will be done. He's saying, God, I take all of life's glory and I lay it in the dust dead. And what is life's glory? Well, it's the money and the status and the popularity and the recognitions and all the things that you and I desperately want, the things that we think will make us happy. And Matheson says, no, I'm not going to grasp for those things any longer. I lay them in the dust dead. And George Matheson, he didn't scream and yell. He said, Lord, if I have to give these things up, if I have to lay them down in the dust, I know that somehow you will work something out of them that would have never happened if I had not surrendered them to you. Somehow, if I give you these things, Father, I know that you will bring a, a miracle out of them, that you will bring redemption out of it, just like you did when Jesus laid down his life. Somehow I know that if I die, there's a resurrection. And somehow I realize that if I lay life's glory down dead in the dust, it will blossom. And only then will it blossom. My desire for money, my desire for popularity, for, for things, I lay them in the dust. I give them to you. Matheson even says, I give you my suffering. And know that you can even use that. And in George Matheson, Matheson's case, he became a more sensitive person, a much more loving person, a wiser person than he ever would have been. And through his ministry, he touched a lot of lives. But that was his case. What's your case? See, friends, every one of us has a cup. It's a little cup in comparison to Jesus' cup. And none of us will ever be asked to take Jesus' cup and pray your will be done. But what I want to know is, how are you handling your cup. Suffering in your life, it will make you either like George Matheson. You can submit it to God. You can give it to God, to his loving purposes, willingly. And if you do that, it'll make you into someone far greater than you are now. Or it'll turn you into something far more shriveled or angrier, or bitter, or sadder. See, the thing about suffering, friends, it never keeps you the same. And those cups that come into our life, they either, either make you far greater or far worse a person. They never leave us the same. 
And some of you are probably thinking, well, if God just told me why, if I just knew why, if I just knew why, I'd be okay. But friends, don't you see that if you knew why, it wouldn't be submission anymore. It wouldn't be obedience anymore. It wouldn't be faith anymore. Do you know what you would do if God told you why? You'd just turn around and say, oh, I see why. And you'd move on. And you'd stay in control of your life. And you continue to be your own little king. See, friends, the power of the cross in your life. It's not exemption from suffering, but it's the ability to have your trans or your it's the ability to have your suffering transformed into changing you, into changing those around you for the better. But it begins with your will be done. O oh, love that will not let me go, I give you back the life I owe. I lay in the dust life's glory dead, and from the ground there blossoms red, life that shall endless be. God, thank you. Thank you that Jesus went to that garden and he prayed, not my will, but your will be done. And so, Father, help us to trust you. Help, a, help us to believe that when we put our lives in your hands, you can do great and mighty things, even with our suffering. And so I pray, Lord, that we can see the grandeur, the glory of your greatness and power and the things of this earth would grow strangely dim. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, we're going to sing that hymn of George Matheson, O love that will not let me go. And if you don't sing it, at least let the words just sort of, just let them fall over you. O oh, love that will not let me go.
Well, friends, I hope this service was a blessing to you. I hope my words were, were challenging. I hope your faith was strengthened, your heart was warmed, and you were drawn closer to God and Jesus Christ. Friends, go. Go in God's grace, God's love, God's mercy. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, have a great week.